to, we're going to talk to Matt and Amanda about the book, and then we're going to work in some of your questions. So my first question was, um, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I think I think it was really we've been I've been in the industry for 18 years now. She's been in about 16, and so over the years, you obviously you hear a lot of stories, you experience a lot of things with different clients, but. 95% of our clients are in the real estate industry. And so it was kind of a, when you hear the recurring stories, the recurring mistakes, or the lessons that people need to learn, it just seemed like a great avenue to kind of put them together and, and do it in a way that was, it was fun. You know, um, obviously taxes aren't the most exciting topic. And I congratulate you all for sitting here after lunch, listening to a tax talk. So um, good for that. But it was just, I think it was a good way for us to do it in a fun way, teach people some lessons that can reach the, a, a lot of people, not just, you know, maybe our clientele per se. But I think that was one of the motivating reasons for doing it. One question Googlers ask me is, what can you and what can't you duck things? And so people say, can I write off my kids for my real estate business? Or, you know, not can I write my kids off emotionally, but more on the real estate side of things. <laughs> So maybe you can go over some of the common deductions that real estate investors miss. Yeah, I think one of the main things to understand is that anything potentially could be tax deductible. So the question you ask yourself is, you know, if you're spending money on something, is it ordinary and necessary for my real estate business, right? So some of the most commonly missed ones would be like car expenses, travel costs, cell phones, computers. These are things that we all use on a day-to-day -day basis personally, but we also use it to help us in our real estate, right? So there's a common myth out there that we can't deduct any of these things unless we have a legal entity. So that's a question we get all the time. You know, do I have to have an LLC to deduct certain things? Um, fortunately, the answer is no. The IRS doesn't really care whether you have an entity or not. What they care about is whether you have a business. And business really just means, do I have an intent to make profit? Right. In our example, it's the real estate business. So that's probably, you know, like you said, the most common question, what can I deduct? It's hard to say what you can, you know, what you can't deduct would be things that are more not necessary for your real estate business. So as an example, for a lot of our clients, we have a list of 100 tax deductions. Um, it's a little checklist. Of course, that's not going to apply to everybody. Not all 100 items will be applicable to your real estate business. Um, but the key is to learn to think about it from a more creative perspective. And I know all Googlers are very creative in nature. Um, so the question to ask yourself when you're spending money on something is, how can I make this ordinary and necessary for my particular real estate business? Excellent. Now, for people who don't have an investment property, yet they're going out to scout for property, um, can we write those expenses off? And do we have to write them off the same year we find that property? Or is there a way to hold on to those for a couple of years or so? It, it's a good question and one that we do get a lot. It's So if you are looking for your first property, you are going to incur expenses to do that. You're going to incur, incur travel. You might, you know, maybe you're putting some expenses down for property that, you know, to do an inspection or appraisal, or whatever it might be. Um, if it's your first property you're buying, all those pre-acquisition costs are going to get lumped together. As it's generally what's considered startup costs of your business. And startup costs, you can write off up to $5,000 right away once you start business. So with an investment property, the easiest way to think about it when you start business is when you actually close on the purchase of the, of the property. So at that point in time, if, if you've incurred less than $5,000, you can write them off all right away. If you've incurred more than 5000 you take 5000 right away, and the rest you can write off over 15 years. Uh, not, you know, 15 years is a long time, obviously. not a great answer. Most people want to write things off right away. But that's kind of the way that the, um, the tax law looks at it. Yeah, and I think something to add that, you know, if you think about it, what the IRS is really doing is they're incentivizing us to pull the trigger and invest sooner rather than later, right? So they're rewarding, you know, if you're spending money to learn how to do real estate, you're traveling to look at real estate, really the deduction comes in once you start investing. So the earlier you start investing, the better the tax deduction, right? On the other hand, if you're someone who's been taking classes, it's been years and years and years and still haven't really pulled the trigger yet, those items still could be tax deductible, but it's just going to be delayed into the future when you actually pull the trigger. Gotcha. 
one thing I struggle with is when I go on scouting trips, I have all of these receipts and it's just very time consuming writing all these receipts down and putting them in the right Excel spreadsheets. How do you guys manage that? A lot of our clients, a lot of our clients use QuickBooks. It's a very popular counting software. It's, um, we like to say it's, it's good and bad. It's good because it's very easy to use and it's bad for us because it's very easy for you guys to use it. So <laughs> depending on how well you, a person utilizes it, but it can make things easier. Um, one of the things that we kind of learned from a mentor early on was to hire a hire an assistant. You know, that might seem kind of like a crazy, crazy idea for if you're just starting investing, but it can be a virtual assistant, something like that. Or it could like be that. your kid, like what Jordan said earlier. Yeah. If you want to hire your kids to help with your real estate business, what a great person to help you scan receipts and do data entry. Right? And, yeah, and that's a good point is the IRS doesn't, they don't need to see paper, you know, obviously. So you can scan a receipt and toss the receipt. So, you know, scanning and organizing, you know, however it makes sense for you, whether it's file folders or, on, you know, on, on the cloud or whatever it is, uh, just find something that works for you. But. Uh, you just need to be able to find the receipt if you ever need it. Um, so I, that's kind of the, I think that's some big good tips that we've, you know, talked talk to our clients about. Excellent. Now, you guys have been are practicing CPAs, so I, I was lucky to come across you guys through Bigger Pockets, but then I get asked through the Google alias, um, how do I go about finding a good CPA? How do I judge if the CPA can work with real estate investors? Do you have any tips you could share to help us identify good CPAs? Um, you know, I think you're a local community. So if you're an investor, you're probably networking with other investors. So it's a good idea to ask who other people are using, you know, what's been their experience in working with CPAs. Um, you know, in the interview, ask them questions about real estate. You know, what are you seeing with your other clients? What are your other clients doing in real estate? Do they have issues with obtaining financing or obtaining deals? So that'll help you gauge, you know, how involved they are in real estate. I know a lot of real estate investors are very creative. So doing a lot of creative deals with a lot of tr creative terminology. So you just want to make sure you work with someone who understands the terminology you're talking about. So if you're doing a lease option and you're talking to them and you get a really glazed look, that's probably a, you know, a sign that you're not talking to the right person, right? Because they're supposed to be your advisor. So just things like that, you know, I mean, talking to them, getting to know how much they really understand your industry. And I think it's good to point out too is that just like doctors or attorneys, not all accountants are created equal or do the exact same thing. So just because someone's a CPA and does taxes doesn't mean they do taxes for real estate investors. So that, you know, obviously that can be question number one and then dig into other further questions. But because um, we see that time and time again where people have hired somebody who just doesn't have experience in real estate and things are missed and. Sometimes you can fix it, sometimes you can't, so it you know, mm -hmm. can create issues down the road. Yeah, and believe it or not, we actually have a handful of clients who are CPAs themselves. Um, they do taxes, you know, maybe for manufacturing or R&D stuff, and then they have us do consulting or we actually do the tax returns for all their real estate things. So, you know, it's perfectly fine if you have lots of, you know, different things going on, um, just to make sure you're speaking with some, you know, the right person, right? The thing that is the funniest to me I hear all the time is people with, um, call me and say, oh, you know, I heard about this particular strategy. And I say, where did you hear that from? And they'll say, oh, I heard it from my realtor, right? So that's not what you want to do. You don't want to be taking tax advice from your realtor or your dentist. Right. <laughs> what are some common mistakes that CPAs make in the, in the tax field when they're working on their returns? I think with, with respect to real estate, believe it or not, one of the biggest ones that we see missed is um, depreciation. So for those of you who are you know, maybe new to real estate investing, Depreciation is you buy a property, uh, just like a stock, you don't necessarily get to deduct the property right away. You got to write it off over time and you do that through depreciation. So it's kind of a paper expense. You get a certain amount every year. Um, now for us who does real estate tax stuff all the time, it's kind of like real estate 101. But 10, 15% of the time we see it either done wrong or believe it or not, totally just not taken at all. So we, I mean, we had a client a couple years back that had I don't know, a dozen properties. She'd owned them for 10, 12, 15 years. And you look at her return, she hadn't taken depreciation on any of them over the years. So the benefit of the depreciation is it, it's an expense you could deduct against your other income from the rental property. So, you know, maybe you had cash flow positive, but with the depreciation, you're at zero, or maybe you're even a loss on your, on your rental property for tax purposes, which could be a good thing. And this person had missed out for 10 or 12 years. And so luckily there was a way we could help her, but it was just, kind of mind-blowing when you look at it that 
yeah, you haven't been doing this for, <laughs> you're a real estate investor and, you know, working with somebody who haven't done this for so long. Yeah, I think another thing, maybe not a mistake per se, but, you know, I think a lot of accountants or most accountants um, are not creative by nature. You know, I mean, so we're, you know, we're, we're more critical thinking. And so um, I think a really good practice to get into when you meet with your tax advisor, instead of asking them, you know, like you were saying earlier, how can I write, you know, uh, uh, can I write off my kids, right? Can I write off my kids? Can I write off uh, this particular purchase? Maybe the immediate answer is no, you can't do it, right? But instead, rephrase the question to ask, how can I write off my kids, right? How can I do it? Well, maybe you can have your kids help in your real estate business. How can I write off my trip to Florida? Well, maybe you can um, have some predetermined business meetings, schedule things with local real estate investors or potential lenders working in your deals. Um, so just that adding that one simple word, um, I think really helps a lot when you're meeting with your tax advisor to put them in that more creative thinking. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I tell people this all the time and it's interesting because sometimes I have clients that throw this back to me. You know, <laughs> I was talking to someone the other day that said, I had a big legal expense, personal stuff, can I deduct it? And I said, no. And he's like, well, the question is, how can I deduct it? So then it was a completely different conversation. Right. right. Um, so you had a story in your book about Jeff, about him creating the entities. Can you talk about that story and then go into common pitfalls people find themselves in regarding setting up entities and real estate investing? Sure. I'll mm -hmm. let you do that. <laughs> well, so Jeff is a, let's say Jeff is, is somebody that he, kind of a newbie investor, and I'm, I'm trying to re recall the facts to the T, but I think, I think he lost his job, right? Um, and he was going to, getting into real estate and going to different seminars, educate, educating himself, which is important. It's, it's, it's a good practice to be in. But he got to the point where he was going to these things and he was forking over thousands of dollars on education and or creating legal entities. You know, one of those, I don't know if you guys have been to educational events like that, where it's the run to the back of the room for the next five minutes and you get this great deal and you can create 10 entities and, you know, circle the wagons or whatever cool. it is, you know. So he did something like that where at the end of the day, he was, what was he, he was in 10 grand? He was in 10 grand in with four new entities, and when you look back, that he didn't have a single property yet. So yeah, one of the issues that he asked us, you know, what is our fee for doing tax returns? Because we met him at a, a local real estate club. And so I was really excited when he was telling me about all these different entities. So I was like, okay, well, you know, how many properties? What are we talking about? And that's when we learned he didn't have any properties. And so that's the part that's very alarming. And I think, you know, just touching on maybe a common mistake for people starting out, um, you know, you, you, you do want to have your entities and your strategies in place, but you don't necessarily always need to be pulling the trigger on entity formation per se. Okay. So as an example, if you have no properties yet, keep track of your expenses, right? They will become tax deductible when you do start investing in real estate. Um, but what we don't want you to do is, you know, go out and spend a lot of money on attorneys and CPAs and form all these entities. If you're really not going to be able to buy property maybe until next year, right? Because California, not only do we have to pay the attorney to form the entity, the state also charges us at least $800 per year per entity, just in fees, right? So that's before you start making any money, we just want to make sure <clears throat> that the cost is justified by the profit that you're going to be making. Well, and think about it for Jeff too. He was 10 grand in that he had already spent and that was, I think he had even borrowed most of that, if I remember. And he had no other money. That could have been $10,000 as a down payment on a potential investment property. You know, obviously out of state, probably somewhere. But so you, that's the thing you got to look at is, you know, weighing, you know, what do you, what do you have to spend and not doing, you know, um, what is it, paralysis by analysis or analysis paralysis. Where we've seen that, where people, they want to they wanna feel like they need, I need to know this much or whatever, whatever that much is. They need to feel like they need to get there where, when in reality, you know, take small steps, you know, pull the trigger, you know, learn your lessons. Um, you can always create an entity after the fact if you need it for asset protection and transfer the property, the title of the property into the entity. So that's doable. It doesn't need to be done, right, you know, up front. So there, there's ways to make it work without, you know, spending a boatload. Right. Yeah. So I hear people talking about setting up LLCs for tax benefits. 
Are there additional tax benefits you gain with an LLC? Um, well, it depends. It depends on what you're doing in real estate. Real estate is kind of a general term, right? So you could be doing rental real estate. You could be doing property management. Yeah. You could be doing wholesale we'll and fix buy, and we'll flip. Say buy and hold. Most of us do that. For yeah, yeah, for buy and hold, there is not an added tax benefit. Okay, so what that means is if you buy a rental property down the street, you will get the same write-off and deductions as if you own the property in your individual name. Okay, so earlier we were talking about maybe shifting income to your kids, right? Pay them to help with your receipts and bookkeeping on the rentals. You can do that with an LLC, or you can do that if you own the property in your personal name. Same with travel expenses, if you're deducting a home office. All those are the same with or without an LLC. Now, if you're someone who's more involved in active real estate, and you know some common examples of that would be wholesaling, flipping, you're doing syndications, maybe you're a realtor also on the side and you're making commissions income. In those examples, there are tax benefits of being inside of a legal entity um, because that type of income is taxed differently than rental real estate. But for rental real estate purposes, um, there's not really an added benefit. In fact, there's a cost that we just talked about, right? $800 at least to the state every single year. So for, but we do have a lot of clients who have um, LLCs for rental real estate. Mostly it's for asset protection purposes. Okay, so if you're someone who has a lot of equity um, in the real estate or if you have a lot of net worth, it could make sense to have an LLC just for asset protection reasons. Okay. Now, are there other ways to get asset protection outside the LLCs, like umbrella insurance or anything else? Yeah, there's, it's a great question. Uh, there's, there's other ways for sure. It's, and we talked to our clients about that. I mean, you know, one is, is legal entities. That's one option. You mentioned umbrella insurance. That's a good option as well. Um, you know, one, one of the tips we like to mention with umbrella insurance is to, just to make sure that the activity that you are hoping it's going to cover, that actually the insurance covers that activity because we've talked to actually our, even our own insurance agent, like, one of our rental properties, like, and we want to make sure the umbrella covers, you know, investment properties. Yes, it does. Okay, well, send us the policy. We flip to the exclusions page, and lo and behold, you know, bullet point number five says it excludes investment properties. And so he obviously didn't know what he was talking about. So I mentioned that because I've heard that from clients as well, is that sometimes they look at their exclusions and it specifically mentions it's not included. So uh, if you're going to get an umbrella, make sure if it covers it. If it doesn't, make sure it has a rider that covers investment properties. Um, also debt, you know, debt is a really good asset protection tool. So if you have a property where it's mostly debt, um, you know, odds of someone suing and getting access to that small amount of equity is probably not as traumatizing as if you had a property where you might have paid all cash or you have a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of equity sitting in there, right? That might keep you up at night. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I have a specific question for a Googler. Um, when would an S Corp make more sense than LLC? Uh, the person owns two investment houses and would like to buy more. The growing question for my husband and I is, should we own these individually or have them in some sort of business corporation? What is the best way to structure owning multiple properties to optimize taxes paid and protect ourselves? Um, so that's a really good question, kind of going back to what we were just talking about. right? For rental real estate, whether you own one or whether you own 100, there's really not a tax difference whether you own it personally or in your LLC. Um, now, for that particular person, the question about the S corporation, um, that's a really good question. So generally, we recommend S corporations for active real estate income. Okay, so wholesale, fix and flip, real estate commissions. Um, one of the, the a little tip that we tell a lot of our clients is if you're someone who's doing active real estate, Okay, it might make sense to form an LLC. That LLC, we can always choose later on how it wants to pay taxes. So meaning a year from now, we can look back and say, well, how did your active real estate do? What was the profit? Was it 10,000? Was it 100,000? And from there, we can retroactively file changes with the IRS to say, okay, now I want this LLC to be taxed as a S Corp or a C Corp or even just as a disregarded entity being an LLC itself, okay? Um, on the active income side, if you're a real estate investor making active income, the S-Corp does save you roughly 7 to 15% in taxes on average, as opposed to earning that type of money in your individual name, okay? So that's where the tax savings comes from. 
another tip with the S-Corp. So going back to the investment property, we generally do not recommend having S-Corporations own rental properties, so long-term hold investment properties. Um, the reason being is that down the road it can create adverse tax consequences. So let's say the S-Corp owns the property. It's, you know, maybe it's got debt on it, maybe it doesn't, but you, you're trying to refinance it. Sometimes the banks are going to want the property to be owned in your titled in your personal name for whatever reason, because maybe you're, you have to get the loan or something like that. Well, if you have to transfer title from the S-Corp to the personal net situation, that creates phantom income for you as if you sold the property. And so that's why we generally don't recommend using a C-Corp or even an S-Corp to own rental properties. That's where, you know, owning your personal name or looking at LLCs for asset protection would be the probably the way to go. Makes sense. Uh, another question from a Googler. If I purchase a buy and hold property under my own name, then later decide to create an LLC. How tricky is it to transfer the ex existing property into an LLC without paying gains? I've heard that be that this being done, but I've also read that it can be a pain. It's uh, you know I guess how tricky is it? It's 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 not quote unquote tricky, but it can be done without any tax consequences. So you can own a property in your personal name, decide six months later I create an LLC. I wanted to ho hold title for protection purposes. You can transfer title using a deed. Um, it should be as simple as that. You have to look at your insurance, make sure that you're adding the LLC as an additional insured on your insurance policy. Um, if you have debt on the property, technically that's going to trigger the due on sale clause. So a lot of our clients just leave the debt in their personal name, transfer title, keep paying the debt, and that's not an issue. Can you explain what the due on sale clause Yeah, is? due on sale just means on a mortgage, there's a clause in everybody's mortgage that says if you try and transfer title to this property, <laughs> we as the lender have the right to call the note due, meaning you have to pay us back. Now, most banks, I've never heard of a bank actually doing that, but technically speaking, if you transfer title, they could do it. But again, most banks don't do it, especially if you continue to pay the mortgage, obviously. So um, now you could go to them and ask them. Most banks will probably say no, but you know, so like I said, most clients just kind of transfer title and leave the debt where it is and then just deal with it. Um, going to back to tax strategy. Can you explain what a 1031 exchange is? Yeah, so 1031 exchange, it's um, simple as, you know, think about back to Monopoly, right? You've got the greenhouse, you want to buy the red hotel, or you want to sell the greenhouse and buy two greenhouses. And you want to do it in a tax-efficient manner. So maybe that first greenhouse, you've built up a lot of equity and gains. If you sell it, you're going to have a big gain and a big tax bill. Well, the IRS has this code, 1031, that allows you to sell that, if you reinvest it and follow the rules into new investment properties, you don't have to pay the tax when you sell the, the first property. It basically defers that tax until you sell the, the new properties down the road. But theoretically, you could continue. You could sell one, buy a replacement, sell that one two years later, and just keep rolling this down the road and theoretically not pay taxes for you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So it's a great, it's a great vehicle for investors to keep that chunk, extra chunk of cash you might lose the taxes if you were to sell your property. Because think about it, if your tax bill is going to be 50 grand, I mean, that 50 grand is a down payment on, a, on a, another investment property. So if you can save that now, buy another property that's going to appreciate, generate cash flow for you, you're, just, you're, you're taking away that kind of that tax drag that's going to slow you down from building wealth. Yeah, this is a really interesting um, time for you to bring it up. I just talked to a new client yesterday. Um, the woman is 96 years old, and uh, she came in with her son. They bought a property in L.A. back in the days for something like $20,000. Now it's worth over $2.2 million. And so for them to sell it outright, you know, pay the capital gain between federal and California, you know, in case you didn't know, California doesn't have capital gains. So we're just paying ordinary income tax rates on, on the uh, sale of real estate. So, you know, close to a million dollars would go away into taxes um, if they were to sell this property just without a 1031. So one of the things that we're working on is for them to sell and to buy a couple of replacement properties um, both in state and they're also looking for out of state. So essentially that allows them to, you know, lock in the gain on this, this highly appreciated property with zero taxes, right? And because mom is so old in age, the ultimate strategy would be for mom to basically pass away with these properties 
in her trust. You laugh, but this is a real strategy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't mean the ultimate strategy is for her to pass away, period. I mean, <laughs> after she passes away, um, then the kids inherit the real estate from mom through the trust. And what happens is at that time, the kids can turn around and sell those properties the very next day if they wanted to for $2 million and they would get that money completely tax free. Okay. So 1031 is a very, very powerful strategy. Um, a lot of times for, for many people, for many long-term investors, it's kind of a, you know, let's make sure we keep it in the parent's name and then we pass it to the kids with zero taxes ever. Okay. So the question is, um, she had 2 million. What if the properties were worth a lot more? 5, 10 million. So that's a really great question. Right now, the estate tax, the first rough 5 million is tax free. So for a husband and wife, you know, this strategy is great up to roughly the first $10 million. You don't have to worry about estate, estate taxes. For those of you, um, or you with parents that have over $10 million worth of estate taxes, um, it's going to be a combination strategy. Part of that should probably be gifted to the kids now so that we leave roughly $10 million in parents' name. Yeah, it's really exciting to do, um, you know, that kind of multi-generational planning. Right? So let's say I had a personal residence and I wanted to do a 1031 exchange. Could I sell that property and push those funds into like an apartment complex or mm -hmm. does that have to be a like, like kind property? Uh, so really good question. Um, if you own a primary home, you know, and you've used up, you know, it's highly appreciated, right, in this area. Um, after the gain exclusion, you can only use a 1031 exchange if you turn that home into a rental first. Okay, so if I just have a primary home, it's always been a primary home, I cannot 1031 exchange into some other property. I would have to pay taxes on the gain. What's the difference between a retro retroactive tax strategy and proactive tax strategy? You brought that up in the book and that was a really interesting topic. Well, there's actually no such thing as a retroactive tax strategy, right? Because you can't plan after the fact. Um, so really, you know, if you're meeting with your CPA January through April, there's really not any strategies going on at that time, right? Really, we're just looking at, okay, well, what did you do? And what's the best way we can present what has already happened, right? So in a 1031 exchange scenario, for example, if you sold the property, then we see you next year. Well, we can't really do a 1031 because the year's gone by. And in fact, the sale transaction has been closed. Proactive strategy really is just meeting with your tax advisors throughout the year before you make these um, significant financial or personal decisions, you know, decision to leave your job, to start a new job, to move your retirement money around, you know, buy, sell real estate, obviously. And so because before you enter into a transaction, make, your advisor can help you calculate what is the tax impact, right? And what are the options? Proactive planning really is just another way to say, okay, well, here are your options. You can either replace it and save this amount of taxes, or you can sell the property, take the cash, and you know, and run with it if you wanted to, right? As long as you're willing to pay the tax, maybe down the road. And you know, tax planning doesn't have to be, you know, very in depth or scary. It doesn't have to be hours and hours of sitting with a CPA going over numbers. You know, we really encourage our clients, like, hey, if you're doing anything at all, send us a quick email. You know, you're moving, you're thinking of changing jobs. Send us an email. And then from that, we can look at your situation and say, okay, does this warrant a conversation? You know, do we have follow-up questions or the things that maybe we're concerned with? Or maybe there's nothing we're concerned with. It's like, okay, thanks for the update. You know, I'll kind of keep it in the back of my mind. If something tax law-wise comes up that I think will impact you, you know, that's when some, you know, communication will be made. But it doesn't have to be a very formal process where, you know, it's very time intensive. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, in the book, you have a section about self-directed 401k. Uh, it's kind of a two-parter. First, what is a self-directed 401k? And as far as employees who are working, uh, who have benefits where they get, you know, 401k contributions and match, how can we take advantage of a self-directed 401k? It's um, so uh, kind of break up the question a little bit. So self-directed retirement investing, self-directed retirement plans. The term self-directed, all that means is that it's uh, you know traditionally when you go to open a IRA or Roth IRA to custodian, Fidelity, you know, pick one of Vanguard, whatever. They're going to give you some options of what you can invest in, right? You know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Well, the term self-directed really means you're going to a, a specific type of retirement custodian that will allow you to, you choose what you want to invest in. 
So you can get your IRA to invest in real estate. You can get it to invest in collectibles. You can get it to invest in almost anything. You know, a lot of people don't know that they can use their IRA to invest in things outside of the stock market, but it has been allowed for, I don't know, 40 years or something. So uh, we have a lot of clients that do self-directed investing. Now, they may, they may be using an individual retirement account, a self-directed IRA or self-directed Roth, or they might have their own business where they've set up a self-directed 401k. Um, any, either one of the, any one of those options, the, the type of you know, invest, investing you can do is, is basically all the same. Um, and so if somebody is working at, you know, at Google, you have you know, a retirement account here, but maybe you want to start your own, you, know, you have an IRA on the side, but it's, maybe you're not happy with what it's investing in and, and you know real estate. Well, why not? Maybe you can just roll that money from your existing IRA, open up a self-directed IRA to, at one of these custodians, roll your money over, it's a tax-free rollover, and then just you know, find your investment vehicle for that self-directed IRA and start investing in stuff that you know more about or that you, you, know, you have an advantage, you know, knowledge-wise, you have an advantage over than maybe the stock market or the mutual funds or something like that. I'm curious, um, have you looked into the possibility of rolling your Google 401k money into a self-directed? Have you asked that? Of I haven't personally looked into that, but it's a question. Yeah, that might be yeah. yeah something for you guys collectively to talk to Google about. Um, because the IRS does not really care who your custodian is. Okay, so if if, if it's with Google, if it's with um, TD Ameritrade or Morgan Stanley, so the IRS is the same as if it was with a self-directed custodian, right? So it's kind of like Wells Fargo versus B of A. It's all the same thing to them. So. You know, as long as your employer allows you to do that, then it is possible to roll your money, the work for one k into a self-directed IRA and be able to deploy that for real estate. What's the best income st tax strategy for high-earned income employees here? Um, and to kind of follow through, would it be a good idea to buy an investment property if it was losing money just for the tax benefits? Okay, that's what the softball was being thrown at you. <laughs> I can see from your no. reaction from your eyes, it was like, no, God, no. <laughs> um, you know, I think for, for people with, um, you know, high-income individuals, it is a good idea to, to invest in uh, profit-generating rental real estate, okay? Because on other types of investment you are making, let's say, in the stock market or invest in, you know, another startup company, um, the income that you get is probably going to be taxed, right, along with your W-2 income. So that's going to be at a high tax rate. Versus rental real estate, at a minimum, it does give you a lot of tax write-offs, a lot of the ones we talked about earlier, in addition to what Matt mentioned about depreciation. Right. So it's not uncommon for us to see high income individuals um, invest in real estate with the result being that at least the rental income is coming to them on a tax free basis. OK, so that's the, the, the first tier we want to get to is at least tax free rental income. And that is available, I would say, to the majority of real estate investors. If you're working with the right CPA, there should be enough deductions pulled out so you can reach that level. Then the next question just becomes, OK, if I do such a good job at capturing my expenses that I actually show a loss on my tax return, how can I use that to offset the taxable income from my W-2, for example? And so um, one of the great ways to do that is if you, or if you're married, you have a spouse, um, can qualify as real estate professional, okay? By being a real estate professional, that all that means in the tax world is that you can use the rental losses to now offset the taxable income from your W-2 as well. Okay, so instead of seeing them separately, it's now all rolled into one. So a big picture, you know, maybe you've got enough rental properties that, like we talked about, are cash flow positive, but we can generate enough depreciation, the home office deduction, some hiring your kids, other strategies to generate it. The expenses are more than the income, so you have a loss now. But really, you're still cash flow positive, but now we're just taking, utilizing deductions for all the things you already are paying for, and then you can use that to offset the income taxes you're paying on your W-2. That's the ultimate goal, and that's where... If you can get someone in the family that can qualify as a real estate professional, that would allow you to do that. Um, or go marry somebody that's a real estate professional. You know, that could be a, a marriage counseling here, you know. Right. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's one way. I mean, you talked about other, other things for high income earners. One of the things we talked to a lot of clients about is because something we're passionate about. I know you said you, you give back a lot of your time. You can incorporate charitable giving with real estate investing. There's a, lots of different strategies out there. I mean, obviously you can give 
straight cash to a charity. You can give, you know, household goods to charity. You can do all that. But there's more advanced strategies where you can put money in. Things are charitable trusts that you can put money in. You can get a deduction, a donation deduction for the money going in. And then the trust actually goes out and buys rental properties and generates cash flow and then donates the cash flow to charities. And so it's a way for you to still buy real estate, build wealth, but at the same time get tax deductions now if maybe you can't qualify as a real estate professional, but so you're still offsetting the high W-2 income. So there's different ways to, to do it. Um, and yeah. sometimes it just involves changing the fact pattern a little bit. People have to be willing to change their fact pattern. I was going to say about the charitable planning strategy. I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's a somewhat advanced strategy. But one of the things that a lot of people like about that is at the end of the day, um, you do own the asset again. So, you know, if what you donated into the charitable trust is uh, three rental properties, for example, at the end of the trust term, those three properties revert back to your ownership or your LLC or your estate, however you dictate it. And so that that makes sense. Um, a lot of times if we have clients who have an extraordinary year, you know, maybe stock options or, or payouts or something like that, and they want to buy real estate, they don't necessarily need the income from the real estate just yet, you know, but they do want the asset. They do want to own the real estate in the future. It's a really great way to get a very large write-off in a year where, you know, you have a, a significant increase um, of income. Actually, I had two questions. One, uh, just on your, your very first thing about, I have two rental properties and also an umbrella pro policy. And what, what, uh, what would we need the umbrella policy for in terms of the rental property? So... So the question is, you know, what do you need the umbrella policy for for the rental properties? It's more for the it's more for the exposure. So what happens if, you know, and obviously we're not attorneys, we're not litigation attorneys, but it's more of a, you know, if the crap hits the fan, you know, somebody trips and falls on your property or falls off a fall, yeah, on, on your rental property, falls off a railing or decides to sue you for some reason and, you know, can make the argument that they, you know, in a court of law that they should be entitled to something. That's where the insurance, the umbrella insurance, theoretically would kick in to protect you for having to fork out, you know, fifty thousand dollars to some plaintiff or something. Sorry, actually, but my most important question, my kind of funny personal thing, but my sister is breaking up with her boyfriend in Atlanta, and he, they own a condominium. She owns one third, he owns two thirds. She doesn't have a lot of money, a lot of income, so I'm going to buy him out his two thirds property, his two thirds portion. How should I structure that in terms of my income tax, or how would a person, buy, any, anybody here buying a property with a sibling, how can you do that so that you can maybe treat that as rental income, and I could get some kind of deduction, and uh, but she can continue having partial ownership? That's a really good question. So um, I'm assuming your sister is going to still live there as her primary home. So generally, the way we set up on the tax return side is you would claim the you know half of it or two thirds of that um, as rental, uh, rental income, rental expenses, and then her portion of that she would just claim as a regular primary home. So she'll have a little bit of mortgage interest and property taxes. Now, with respect to you know how you hold title, you know again if it's a rental property we're not very too concerned with taxes, right? There's no tax benefit or detriment either way. Keep in mind, even though it's an out-of-state property, and if you formed an out-of-state LLC, just by the fact that you're a California resident means that you will have to pay $800 for that out-of-state LLC here. So really the question is, you know, what, you know, how comfortable are you with going into partnership with your sister, right? The odds of you guys suing each other, um, you know, if you guys are close, the odds of your sister as your tenant suing you is probably very low. Yeah, the question is if um, if you're not really charging a lot of rent, how does that work as a rental? So on the tax side, you do have to charge her rent. Otherwise, you don't have a, a, a stance to take as a rental property. Okay? It could be below market value, right, because it's a partial ownership. That's perfectly fine. So maybe she pays you $300 of rent, but you'll you'll still get your you know half or two-thirds of mortgage interest and stuff like that. But isn't that more of a gift? Than and it can be. A gift, gift taxes can definitely come into situations and where family members are involved and you're, you know, have transactions or blow market. So there's definitely things to think about. The other thing I was thinking was in terms of how you structure the ownership, you might want to look at economically, outside of taxes, economically look at, you know, do you get a better deal buying it all yourself, you know, from a mortgage standpoint or a financing perspective or maybe flip-flop, maybe your sister does. So those are other things outside of taxes, things to think about too, just, you know, and how you, how you actually buy the property. 
I was curious if uh, you do much with uh, family limited partnerships. This is something I read about recently that was pretty fascinating for protecting your your uh, assets as well as shielding uh, your uh, taxable inheritance. Yeah, family limited partnerships are very very popular. They've been around for tried and true in the tax world and the in the court, tax court for decades. Um, they are very common in with families that have a large amount of assets. So we were talking about the $10 million earlier. Um, family limited partnerships can be very helpful in those situations where you're trying to, as Amanda was mentioning, kind of gifting ownership of partial ownership of properties over time to your kids. So that can be a way to kind of start um, taking a portion of the, of the asset out of, out of the parents' estate so that they're, they're decreasing their value of their estate to maybe try and get under the $10 million. But at the same time, they're still kind of controlling the asset. Uh, but the kids are sort of involved in the business because in the limited partnership, generally it's you know four, five, six family members are all the partners. And so it's kind of it's that's where it's used a lot. Uh, it can be there's ways to use it to shift income to different different kids as well. So there's there's a lot of benefits for it. But from a big picture perspective, we see used a lot with the with the families that have five, ten, fifteen million dollars plus in assets. Yeah, the question was, um, in terms of asset protection, can it be a better vehicle for investing within the family than an LLC? Um, I think that's probably more of a question for an attorney. And it, it can't, I think it probably could be, um, but theoretically they both come with quote unquote limited liability protection. So um, I, I'd really have to defer that to an attorney. I think practically speaking, um, the vast majority of our clients who own rental real estate um, use LLCs rather than family limited partnerships. Um, our older clients who've been in real estate for many, many years tend to use family limited partnerships. And I think partly because the nature of the estate planning component, and then partly just because, you know, um, back in the days, FLPs were much more prevalent, and now LLCs are, you know, typically more preferred by attorneys for asset protection, so. And, I, and another, I guess, thing worth pointing out is with a limited partnership, technically, with every one of them, you have to have what's called a general partner. The general partner is the person or the, the entity that's going to have unlim unlimited liability exposure. So a lot of times with the limited partnerships, you have to create a corporation to be the general partner uh, to hold, you know, one, five, ten percent. Now, obviously, that can be done. It's not, it's not you know, earth, earth shattering, but it's one other thing you've got to do. It's another corporation you've got to create with an LLC. You don't have to have a general partner, per se. So, so I have a question. It's got a newbie question. So suppose I have a primary residence. I stay there for a couple of years and build some equity, like uh, maybe build some equity. And then what's the best strategy? Compare, say, I sell the house and then get like half a million uh, capital gain free, or I cash out some of the money and then to do like house improvements and then get the benefits of the like uh, mortgage tax kind of deduct deduction. Or compare with I uh, use the cash out money on rental property, and I heard I can also get the kind of the uh, deduction on the mortgage interest. So compare these three strategy, which one is the most, say, tax efficient in the longer run? Well, I think if your primary home um, is highly appreciated, uh, from a tax perspective, first and foremost is to lock in that 250 or 500,000 tax-free. And so you can do that, you know, let's say, um, you sold your house today, you've been in there for a couple years, you know, two to three years, then that's fine. You can move out, sell it, get the tax-free gain, right? Take the cash and then do whatever you want with it. Buy other rental properties, buy a new primary home. That's all perfectly fine. If you feel like that home has more appreciation potential, you want to keep it, but you want to turn it into a rental, you can do that as well. Um, we do recommend though that, you know, if you move out of your home, you sell it within three years of turning it into a rental, okay? Because you have that additional three-year grace period where you have that rental income, and when you go sell, you still can tap into that two hundred fifty or 500000 of capital. So even though you moved out three years ago, you still get to use that primary residence tax-free exclusion, even though it's been a rental property for the last three years. So you can even, you can do that, and then you can tack on the 1031 exchange that we talked about earlier, so you can actually take your $500,000 tax-free cash in your pocket, do a 1031 exchange on the rest of the property, buy a replacement investment property, 
and then continue to roll that, but still get your, your tax-free money in your pocket. So we've had clients use that multiple times and it works out really well. Yeah, you can do both, it's yeah. awesome. Oh. So the question is, you know, if I keep the property, refinance it, use the money to do home improvements to you know, improve that property or refinance it and use that money to go out and buy an investment property. And I think it's gonna, you know, from an accountant's perspective, it's gonna kind of come down to numbers. It's like, what, you know, if you're gonna improve the property, what's it gonna be, what's it gonna be worth after you appreciate it? After it appreciates and improves, what do you plan to do with it? Um, if you do take the money out and reinvest it, where are you gonna reinvest? What kind of returns are you gonna get? Um, yeah. You know, we like tapping into equity and utilizing because you don't, you know, we don't necessarily want equity not doing anything for you, but you got to be smart about it and, and make good decisions, obviously. So, yeah. so in terms of transferring property from parents to children, is leaving it in a trust until they die, like by far the best strategy, or um, are there advantages it, to it? It depends on the net worth of the parents, right? Yeah. So, if the parents, you know, combined net worth is under ten million dollars, then generally speaking. That would be the case. You know, of course, there's always going to be different things that are non-tax related that come into play. You know, the health of the parents, would they need long-term care? Do they have creditors? The, the general, age, age of the parents? Yeah, but generally speaking, yes, under 10 million, um, it's better to leave assets in the parent's name and have the kids inherit. And that's not just for real estate. That's also with, you know, stocks, um, anything that appreciates in value. And the reason for that is when we pass away, every person gets what's called a step-up basis. So regardless of what you bought the property or your stocks for, when you die, the kids or whoever your beneficiaries are will get it at whatever that day's value is. And there's no limit to that step-up? There's no limit to no. the step-up, yeah. So I, I had a client the other day who was basically asked the same question. You know, their parent was, I want to say, 75, 76. And kind of my response was, no, I don't think it makes a lot of sense because your parents, your parents are closer to death than they're not. It's like, what does that mean? He's like, my parents are in good health, and I said, well, they're 75. That means they're not 30. They're not 40. They're, they're closer to passing away than they were 30 years ago. And so, their window for passing away, you know, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 20 years, but they're still closer to that than they were. And so, it, if there's a lot of gain in there, it's 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 hard to advise somebody to give up on that tax-free gain that you could get, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, if, if we have a primary residence and also like some buy and hold rental property, can you talk about um, if AMD affects what we can deduct or? So, so if I understand the question, so you've got a primary residence, you've got a rental property and kind of how that plays in affecting AMT? Yeah, well, if, if our job makes us fall into AMT, like does it change any tax yeah. strategies? So, um, AMT is just a, it's an acronym. It just means alternative minimum tax. For a 30,000 foot level, it's a, it's kind of an extra tax that the IRS put in place about 30 years ago because it was actually put in place to, so that the wealthy people at the time could stop using all these tax loopholes they were using to avoid paying taxes. And so they, they were trying to put in place a minimum level of tax that they wanted people to pay. And so, um, unfortunately for people who live in California, um, it's kind of like a parallel tax system. One of the things that's not deductible for AMT is state income taxes. And California and New York are the two states that have the highest state income taxes. You know, your highest rate here is like 13%. So, generally speaking, if somebody's making, taxpayer in California is making $150,000 to $300,000 a year and paying good chunk in state taxes, they're probably going to be an AMT, whether you have a rental property or not. Um, and so there's things you can do for AMT to, to plan for it, but just from a reality standpoint, it, you know, people live in California who are making, you know, six figures, you know, single and married, you're, there's a very high likelihood you're going to fall into AMT whether you have an, a, you know, rental property or even a primary residence sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I think we don't see rental real estate as an adjustment either for yeah. or against AMT. It's really, I mean, for, for all of us here, the biggest thing that changes that number is state taxes and unfortunately you know there's not much you can do in terms of state tax right i mean is from your w2 job at least it's going to be withheld based on whatever it's the first one is you mentioned that we can write off the cost uh for example looking for um property to invest right so is this applic uh, applicable to foreign countries also or is it only for usa 
Um, no, it's applicable to foreign countries as well. Now, with any kind of travel cost, the key thing that you want to make sure you have in place is predetermined business purpose. So what we mean by that is, you know, if you're going to fly to Asia, for example, you're visiting family, you happen to look at some real estate, that does not make the trip tax deductible, okay? Because it's just, you were on a trip and you happen to do real estate. Um, in order for it to be deductible, you have to have documentation to show that, you know, maybe I scheduled these meetings to meet with these people to look at these properties before you leave. And the reason, if you think of it from the IRS side, they say, well, why did you go to Asia? Well, I went there because I had all these business meetings that I had pre-scheduled, mm -hmm. okay? okay? And so that's the same, you know, out of the country, in the country, you know, going down to Southern California. It's always that same underlying concept of what is the reason I went there? Thank you. So my second question is, um, how can we write off the cost on the time we spend for rental purpose? Like, it's not like uh, for home improvement, we have receipt, but sure. we don't have this for the time we spend. That's a really good question. We get that a lot. Unfortunately, the answer is not a good one. So. Um, the way that the yeah, you asked it right away. How can I? But. How can I? <laughs> <laughs> so you can. Okay, no, let, let me. I'll re-answer it then. So you can. However, you would have to pick up that same dollar amount as income. Okay. So that just means, if, for example, if you hired me to do your house improvements, you write off what you pay me, but I pick that up in taxable income because I earn the money. And so, if you wanted to pay yourself, you could certainly do that. We don't recommend it for anyone at all because you're just writing off and picking up income the same exact dollar amount. So I know people will say, well, I value my time, right? Maybe I charge $100 an hour or $500 an hour to my clients, but I can't charge myself. I mean, I can, but it's just a wash. So we don't really factor that as a cost. A similar question we get is, you know, I donate 10 hours a month to charity and I value my time at $200 an hour. So I think I should be able to take a charitable deduction for that, that value. Unfortunately, you can't, so. But you can yeah. deduct all the supplies and travel yeah. costs for all your charitable work. So. Right, right. Yeah. If you have rental uh, income property in San Francisco and you have uh, with, uh, with tenants who pay below market rate um, rent, is the amount that you would pay them to move out tax deductible? Oh, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. So you mean ca like kind of like cash for keys when you pay them to have them move out? Yeah. Yes, that is definitely yeah. a tax deduction. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Unfortunately, we see that more often than we'd like. <laughs> uh, so you guys mentioned that there's not real difference in tax benefits between LLC and uh, just holding it in your name. Is that also true if you're trying to buy properties with a 50-50 partnership? Uh, well, so it depends on what is the intent for the property. Okay. Uh, buy and hold. If it's a rental real estate, it's neutral for tax purposes, then the only reason you would have an LLC is if you have asset protection concerns with that particular partner. So kind of going back to the other example with the sister, right? My sister, she's not going to sue me. I'm not going to sue her. You know, something would happen to me. We know each other's wishes. You might not need it. Um, if it's with another coworker or, you know, even a more distant family member or a friend, you might want to have a partnership in place if there is an asset protection concern between the two of you. Another, th another thing actually to add to that is one situation where it might make a difference is, let's say you're going to buy it individually 50-50, you're going to, you know, legally you're probably going to own it as tenants in common, what's called tenants in common. So for tax purposes, that means you own 50% of it, you have to report 50% of the income and report 50% of the expenses. Whether or not you actually collected 50% or not, uh, maybe she collected 100%, you still have to report 50%. Now, so let's take that to the other situation. Maybe maybe you want ways to say, okay, we own a 50-50, but I'm going to take 75% of the, of the expenses or losses for the next you know, five years until we sell it. Then you know, we'll even it out in the back end. If you want to be able to do that, then doing an LLC would uh, would be the way to go versus the tenants in common because you wouldn't be able to do that as tenants in common. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends. If you're planning to share things 50-50, other, other than the asset protection makes no difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The, I mean, just one little tidbit to throw out on legal entities. I know we kind of talked quite a bit about that. Um, timing is also important. Okay, so for California, the $800 fee is not a prorated amount. Okay, so if you form, let's say you felt like, you know, I do want that asset protection from my partner we're talking about. So now we're close to September, right? Let's say by the time you decide to go into this deal, it's going to be November. 
And so if you form the entity in November, you're going to pay $800 for this year, and then you're going to pay another $800 come next year. So you're really only getting that, that benefit for a one-month period, right? So, so timing is also important. If it's the beginning of the year, you're pretty sure this is going to happen. You know, I say, okay, go ahead and form it. But right now, you just want to, you know, be cautious of the time frame of how long you're getting that benefit before you have to pay that second round of $800. Um, a lot of people are doing Airbnb for some of their rentals. Are there any tax benefits that people aren't aware of when they use Airbnb? Yeah, I love Airbnb. We're seeing so many clients do Airbnb. Um, seems to be a very, I mean, we're not doing Airbnb with our rentals, but I, I'm definitely seeing really good um, profit on the Airbnb side. Um, I think the two, well, the main item to think about for short-term rentals like that is that they're treated differently for tax purposes, depending on what is the average number of days that your guests are staying. Okay, so if you look at 2016, the year, on average, if your guests are staying longer than seven days, okay, meaning you know eight days or more, then it's treated like a regular rental property, which is great, right? Because the you know we get all the depreciation, it's you know um, rental income. Now, on the other hand, if the average is seven days or less, then it's actually treated like a hotel business, okay? which means it's ordinary income, um, potentially subject to self-employment taxes, payroll taxes. So there definitely is planning involved if you're doing short-term rental stuff, um, you know, depending on how significant the income is. That might be one of those rare situations where we would recommend a corporation for that particular real estate. But yeah, again, it's it's a good it's a we're seeing it as a great business model because people are getting better returns on their on renting the exact same property that they used to rent for you know twelve month period of time to one tenant. They're renting you know the thirty five hundred people over the year and making a lot more money. And so, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just you know it's not the properties that are next to Disneyland. It's it's markets you wouldn't even expect to be quote unquote vacation markets, but they're you know they're finding enough demand for it. So it's it's really working out well for most people. Have they had any strategies that have been proven fruitful because I know there's people who've done it, but there might be a lot of work involved uh, getting tenants in there. It might be more upkeep. You know, I, I have a client um, up here who was targeting more like the corporate um, corporate guests. So he said that's worked out well for him. Um, you know, just from people coming from out of town to do training here. So when they're here, they're here for a couple weeks at a time instead of just you know a couple of days here and there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have people who actually move out of their primary home. I have a client in Hollywood. So he's essentially moved out of his home because it was so much more profitable for him to rent it out uh, on the Airbnb. And then so now he's rent, he's living in a rented apartment. And then his home, he's renting it out. From Chris, my understanding is that deductible, deductible rental losses phase out at $150,000 of income if not pursuing a real estate as a career. Do most wealthy individuals accept this fact and wait until the sale of a property and apply the loss? Or are there other workarounds for this limitation? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, so just to kind of paraphrase it, uh, we were talking earlier about when we have cash flow positive properties, but if we can get enough expenses to get a loss on paper for that rental property. Well, the IRS will say, yes, you can deduct that loss against your other income, but if your income gets to be $150,000 or more per year, that takes away your ability to deduct that loss this year. Now, you get to carry forward the loss. You don't lose it. And that's what the question is referring to. Do people just kind of wait around and use it when in the year that they sell the property down the road? And that's what some people do. Um, another option is people actually start reinvesting money to, to generating better cash flow properties that they can that have positive income on the tax return that they can utilize their losses from the other properties to offset that. Um, that's one That's one avenue we've seen people do. Um, or become a real estate professional where going forward that limitation goes out the window because now you are in the day-to-day -day business, whether it's you or maybe a spouse or something like that. So um, it is a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate limitation because it's been, it's been in place since 1986 and it ha the numbers haven't changed and it's, it's crazy because um, you know, obviously in California, you can get to that, that income pretty quickly for a lot of people. So Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, you know the um, person that asked the question mentioned, you know, the, besides the fact that you could do it if you have real estate as your career. So I think that's a, that's a little bit misleading because to be a real estate professional, it does not mean you have to become a realtor or broker or get licensed. Okay. Real estate professional 
is only a term used in the tax world, and that simply means that you're spending more time in real estate than you are at your jobs. Okay, so now, you know, if you guys are working full time here, that's, that means 40 hours a week. So to be a real estate professional, you gotta be working 41 hours a week. So yes, that is very hard. Um, but what if you have a stay at home spouse? Okay, if you had a stay at home spouse, um, and they're just really watching the kids, doing household things, then really for them to be a real estate professional, they only have to spend at least 750 hours in real estate. And once they reach that goal, then collectively, you guys get to use the benefits of the rental losses in this guy's situation. Uh, the question is, how do you document the time that you're incurring? Um, so the IRS doesn't have a specific requirement. Okay, They don't have a form or anything like that. The only thing they require is a consistent methodology, meaning if you use a notepad, they want you to use that notepad for the whole year, or if it's going to be your calendar, something written in Excel, um, it's gonna, it just has to be consistent. Really, the time tracking doesn't get sent to anywhere. Like for our clients who claim real estate, we don't look at it, we don't audit that kind of stuff. Um, the only time you will be required to produce it is if you were to be audited by the IRS. Okay, let's say you were selected for audit and they said, well, I'm really not sure if you qualify as real estate, I wanna see your time log. And what they'll do is they'll look at your time log, it might have hundreds of entries for the whole year, right? And then what they'll do is they'll go through and they'll do what's called sample selection. They're gonna say, okay, well you said you spend um, two hours at Google listening to a real estate tax talk, prove it. So hopefully you have something, an email, or you know your coworkers can vouch for you that you are here, right? Um, in audits that we've dealt with, thankfully the agents on the IRS side have been pretty reasonable in that they would select things that they think could be proven. So that would mean you went to Colorado for a real estate conference for three days. Okay, you, you should have something that showed me you were there doing the real estate seminar. Right? So really you're trying to keep track of, you know, a date obviously, a description of what you did, a description of, you know, who you met with, what you talked about, obviously the amount of time you spent. Those are the most important, important aspects of it. And, you know, again, however you keep track of it, it doesn't matter as long as it's consistent. But what happens if the wife is a kind of like a, an accountant? in a private family firm, which mainly deals in real estate, does that count as a real estate professional? <laughs> That's a really good question. And the answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends. So um, if she has a significant ownership in the business, then potentially. But if she's maybe working for her parents or something like that, then the answer is no. Um, in this example, you know, and, and the most common times we see this example is like with a W-2 employee. You know, maybe you're um, working for a property management company. Right? You're a W-2. Does that time count? And the answer is no. If you are not a significant owner of that company, yes. If you own that property management company, that is your real estate time, even though you're managing for other people. For the self-directed 401ks, do any of your clients, or can you advise what your clients maybe use as the custodials? Because sometimes some of the bigger firms like Pensco or whatnot charge a lot of fees, and I see a trend where they, they have these IRA checkbooks, and I'm concerned that that could get me into some legal issues because I don't know all the rules. Um, the So the self-directed arena, you know, if you Google self-directed, there's going to be hundreds of names that pop up. Um, but yes, I do agree, Pensco is one of the you know more reputable ones, they're larger, so the fees are a little bit higher. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of you know like the question with how do you find good CPAs, I would look through your network here, bigger pockets. People will share with you their experience, you know, maybe paperwork took too long or you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, with respect to the, the checkbook IRA, uh, it's really convenient for people who maybe need to write checks out all the time. The most common times we see that is if we have, I mean, we don't have a lot of clients that do that anymore, but back in the days when people used to go out and bid at the trustee sales, they need to have cash to buy the property. Um, so that's where it comes in handy because Pensco is not gonna give you a check within the next five minutes, right? So you do wanna have that flexibility. Now, um, if you're looking to use your self-directed money to do traditional real estate, like buy a rental property, or maybe doing hard money lending where you're lending to other investors, um, that we recommend against doing the checkbook IRA um, for the same exact reason you brought up, you know, unless you are someone very well-versed in the rules of self-directed, it's very easy for you to get yourself in trouble because when you use that, we don't see it, there's no custodian that sees it, 
So it's just more open to uh, mishaps. Um, the other thing is uh, Matt and I went to a, a self-directed training a couple years ago where one of the directors from the IRS was one of the, the speakers. And they did say that there's going to be a heavier effort on their end to audit these um, checkbook IRAs for that exact reason, right? They know that's a lot of money. Potentially, they can come after if you make a small mistake by accident. Because with self-directed, you can, like we were saying earlier, you can invest in almost anything you want. But there's a lot of things that you, quote unquote, can't do even after you get your investment. So they they want you, it's supposed to be a retirement account where you kind of let it let it do its thing, for lack of a better term. And so you, you there's a lot of things you got to keep your hands off of. And that's that's where there's a lot of abuse right now, I think. Um, so I, I bought a, a property recently and, you know, I had I have cash just that I had saved and I wanted to, you know, invest outside of the real estate, I mean, outside of um, stock and bonds. So just kind of diversify. And then the, the big question is, well, you buy a place for, like in this case, it was uh, 1.1 million. And then how much cash do you put down? How do you figure out how much of a, you don't really want to take too much of a loss because we can't write it off as, let's say, as good income earners. But then you don't want to be paying money out of pocket every month either. So I just kind of took a ballpark and said, well, I'll put down 50%, you know, and then I'll, that would cover, um, and I'll get a loan on the, the other 50%, and that would cover basically a break even. And I'm just wondering, what, what's kind of a, I usually go with the 50 50 strategy, but what do you recommend in this case? You know, of course, now I have a lot of capital tied up into one property. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I think it really depends on, I mean, it's going to, the answer is going to be different for every single person. So, I, you know, for you, I would look at, because the, the options would be to put less down and right. carry more debt. And so if you did that, you know, instead of putting 50%, if you put 20% and you did two rental properties, what would be the return on that, right? So higher risk because you have more debt to worry about. Um, so, so the risk tolerance level does come into play. We were talking about that earlier at lunch. And so I think um, at the end of the day, for me as an investor, I look at the numbers. I look at the worst case scenario for me. And I would say, okay, in the worst case scenario, would I be okay? Would I be able to carry this debt on this particular property? And if, if that answer is yes, then I'm comfortable with it. We have a lot of clients that are more higher risk. They want to put the minimum down. They want to get as many properties as possible. You know, maybe because um, they're really young, they're just starting out. They feel like this is the time to take the gamble, right? Mm -hmm. Don't want to wait until I'm almost retiring to take that gamble. So those are the factors that you're looking at. I don't think there's a correct answer to 20% versus 50%. Well, one, I mean, one thing I think we all see here is it's pretty difficult to buy, let's say, um, rental properties and even break even, right? It's just the the factors aren't here, especially in California. So I know it's it's kind of outside of tax advice, but uh, where, where do you see your real, active real estate investors or buy and hold real estate investors? Where are they buying now to make it actually numbers add up to what you said? Yeah. We have a lot of clients. We have a lot of clients buy throughout the country. So we've got a lot of clients that buy in Texas, Georgia, mm. Tennessee, uh, um, Ohio. Flo yeah, Ohio. From where, I mean, I don't know the market in Ohio at all, but yes, I have a lot of people that have cashed out of California going into Ohio. I think the good and bad is, you know, Cal you know they, they take the appreciation from California and they move to Ohio. There, there's probably not going to be much appreciation, but what they're getting is cash flow, right? So th that's a personal question. What's more important to you? Do you need the cash flow to live off of right now? Probably not. So would you rather have the appreciation? Um, another area that we have a lot of clients going into is Florida. So from what I hear, our, our clients that are full act full-time active real estate investors, it sounds like... Florida today is kind of where California was maybe two, three years ago. So people are still flipping there. They're still doing wholesale. You know, wholesale is almost impossible to get here because there's no margins, right? Wholesale is when I get a property under contract uh, at a good price, and then maybe I, I wholesale it to you. You buy it, and then you either turn it into a rental, or you're going to do a fix and flip, and you're going to rehab it. And she gets a and I get a $5,000 wholesale fee for Kind of like a transaction base, you know. So those kind of deals only work when there's a healthy margin in the profit. That's why you know we don't really see a ton of that in California. Um, but yeah, some of those other states, I think, like Matt mentioned, you know, Georgia, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, Ohio. Um, for someone who's always just kind of bought TurboTax and winged it, like, can you talk a little bit about what a typical interaction is with a, a CPA? Like, aside from just filing taxes, what kind of time and expense is there throughout the year and planning and strategy and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's going to differ with every single firm. You know, for us, our emphasis is on tax planning side of things. So we have clients that come to us for planning and tax return, um, or we have clients that come to us just for planning. Um, so, you know, like I said earlier, the, the planning part, I mean, if you've never done planning before, um, if you've always done it yourself, I highly recommend you invest the time and the energy to do you know, at least one comprehensive planning so you have a roadmap to follow on what some of those high level items are. But the reality is that is gonna be um, kind of a living document, right? Because today you have you know, these sets of rentals, tomorrow you might go into a multifamily. And so the strategy itself will be kind of changing throughout the years as well. I think the most effective planning is really just open communication, as easy as that sounds, because really the goal is not for you guys to understand everything there is to know about taxes and be updated with all the various tax changes that come out during the year, right? That's your CPA's job. But your job really is to just to keep them updated, you know, on anything that you think might be changing. I might be buying a car, might be getting married, might be getting a divorce. Those are times when there could be a lot of money at play, you know, shifting of money. Um, that's the times when they will be able to help and guide you on what are some of the things to keep in mind. Well, thank you very much for coming through. You, you. you guys yeah. flew from Irvine to, to join us. So my final question is, are you going to be deducting that expense? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> we start, um, so for trips like this, we basically, you know, we don't even leave the house with our personal card. We just leave our house with a business card because everything here is going to be tax deductible. So. Excellent. Well, th we're gonna. I'm gonna send their uh, contact information out after the talk. But what we're gonna do real quick is give them a round of applause for coming through and thank them. So thank you. Thank you.